Very often, economics has taken the view that war and peace is somebody else's problem. That cop-out is an irresponsible position. All too often, the responses have fallen into one of two groups. The shrug response. Hey, peace is not our problem. If you want to talk about war and peace, talk to political scientists, talk to international relations experts. Our job is simply to grow the biggest economic pie. The other response is what I would call the smug response. Oh yes, economics matters. Just stick to business as usual economic policy. And if you do that, the economy will be healthy and that will diminish the chances of conflict and increase the chances of successful peace building. Both of those responses share a belief in common, that there's no need to rethink or reorient what we do as economists in light of the dynamics of war and peace. And it's that assumption that I want to challenge. Why should we care about wars? Since the end of World War II, millions of people have died as a result of wars. And many of these deaths are of civilians, that is to say non-combatants, people who are not directly engaged in the conflict, but nevertheless die, including, of course, many children. So, for example, in the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, more than half of the deaths, it's estimated, were of civilians, non-combatants. In the Iraq War, of the first two decades of this century, it's estimated that two-thirds of the deaths were of non-combatants. These are horrible costs, horrible human costs, and then on top of them are also the casualties, the physical and uh, mental, psychological injuries resulting from war that afflict many more people and that many of them carry with them for their entire lives. So even if there were no other costs associated with war and violent conflict, this would be enough to make a good case that we should pay attention. On top of those costs, there are tremendous financial costs. These are the things that economists most often think about, though they're not necessarily the most important costs. In the case of the United States, for example, since uh, the turn of the century, the country has spent more than $8 trillion on its military, on military expenditures alone. That includes veterans' benefits. That's a lot of money. Those are resources that potentially could be used for a variety of other purposes, which would directly improve human welfare, as opposed to, in the case of war, often diminishing human welfare. So if we could prevent war, if we could save those financial costs, we would be freeing up a tremendous amount of resources for other and better uses. Thirdly, there are the environmental costs of war. These are also huge and often go unaccounted. Militaries are among the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, contributing to climate change. War, unlike a lot of environmental destruction, which occurs as a byproduct of human activities that are pursued for some other purpose, in the case of war, environmental destruction can often be deliberate. It's part of the purpose, it's part of the aim of those carrying out the destruction. So for example, in the Iraq war, oil field fires in the Gulf and the deliberate spill of oil into the Persian Gulf, one of the biggest oil spill in the history of humankind, those were deliberate parts of the conflict, huge environmental uh, disasters. If you think about land mines, which certainly should count as a form of environmental destruction, you have even many years after the conflict, people dying and being maimed by landmines that are sown initially for military purposes, but in the end, they create a legacy that continues to this day. In Zimbabwe, more than 40 years after that country's war that brought it independence from Great Britain, there's still landmines killing and maiming people. In Cambodia, more than 30 years since the end of its war, 
landmines are killing and maiming people. Another example, and I would be remiss not to mention this one, during the war in Vietnam, the U.S. sprayed toxic herbicides over southern Vietnam in particular, about 15% of the total territory, to defoliate the landscape to make it easier to perceive the enemy. The legacy of that toxic contamination is still with us today and will be around, it's estimated, for at least a century. So these environmental costs of war are also tremendous. When we add up the human, the financial, and the environmental costs of war, I think we have a pretty good case why economists ought to be paying attention to this problem, why they ought to be thinking about how war could be entered in to how they as economists analyze what's happening uh, in economies and what should be done uh, differently. They can also think seriously about how economics could help to not only prevent war, but also heal the wounds of war in the wake of a conflict and try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. The way I got into these issues of war and peace as an economist was through El Salvador in the 1990s. El Salvador experienced a tremendously destructive civil war. The war claimed about 75,000 lives. That's in a country of 5 million people. So in the U.S. context, that would be equivalent to something like 4.5 or 5 million deaths. And then on top of those deaths, roughly a quarter of the population fled the country as refugees, sometimes to neighboring countries like Honduras, sometimes further like to the United States. So the war disrupted people's lives and, of course, disrupted the economy. On one side in that war was a guerrilla group, the opposition to the government, called the FMLN, the Farabundo Marti Front for National Liberation, which was named after the leader of a short-lived peasant uprising against the dictator of that time in the early 1930s. Marti became a martyr when he was summarily executed by a firing squad. On the other side was the government of El Salvador, which was dominated by the country's landowning oligarchy, sometimes called the 14 families, and backed by the U.S. government in the name, above all, of fighting communism. This was during the final years of the Cold War, the global confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, which I'll come back to discussing a bit later. In 1989, two events intensified the search for a peace agreement between these two sides. The first was an FMLN offensive that brought the war to the nation's capital, San Salvador, dispelling the illusion that either side would soon win this war. The second was the murder of six Jesuit priests at the University of Central America in the capital by government security forces which provoked an international outcry and a shift in U.S. policy in favor of a negotiated settlement. The fact that the Cold War was ending at the time was also undercutting the U.S. rationale for pursuing the war. So negotiations then took place, mediated by the United Nations, and they culminated in peace accords that were signed in Chapultepec Castle in Mexico City in January 1992. Among the key provisions of those accords were several that had uh, important implications for economic policy as well as other things. One was the creation of a national civilian police force, the Policia Nacional Civil, to replace the old paramilitary uh, and police forces of the uh, government. This was to be a non-political uh, force 
Most of the recruits were to be recruited fresh. They were to be trained in an academy and trained in human rights, among other things. And the idea was to provide a legitimate force to provide public safety as opposed to a partisan force, which could not be relied upon to secure the safety of much of the public. A second important element was the strengthening of democratic institutions of multiple sorts. And a third important one was a land transfer program for ex-combatants. Not a thorough land reform, more like a land for gun swap, but a way in which in this still predominantly agrarian society, ex-combatants could be integrated back into productive activity in agriculture. I remember when I first went to El Salvador, uh, shortly after the accords were signed, it was in uh, early 1993, and I was up in a village near the Honduras border, an area that had seen terrible bloodshed. I remember at one point a policeman came walking through the village. He was one of the new national civilian police. And the people in this village who had been terrorized by the government forces during the war. At one point had been forced to flee across the river into Honduras where they were shot as they fled from helicopter gunships supplied by the United States to the point where the river was red with blood. These people who'd been so afraid of government forces were so happy to see this policeman come. And they gave him something to drink and they sat and chatted about all kinds of problems, including domestic violence. And it just became really clear to me that this was a tremendously important change that was beginning to occur in El Salvador. And that if such changes could be consolidated, the country could have a much different future from the one it had just uh, gone through. In early 1994, I was asked by the United Nations Development Program to coordinate a study on the relationship between economics and the peace process in El Salvador. As often happens in the wake of a conflict, a conference of aid donors, including the multilateral institutions like the World Bank and IMF, um, European Union, and the bilateral aid agencies and representatives of the government, was held in this case in Washington, D.C., just two months after the Chapultepec Accords had been signed. And at that conference, large amounts of aid were pledged to help consolidate the peace and rebuild the country. Money not only for reconstruction of war damages, but also for trying to help launch uh, El Salvador on a path of sustainable economic recovery. And these uh, pledges of aid were in certain ways part of what you might call an aid for peace bargain. The aid was a carrot which helped to induce the warring parties, both the government and the FMLN, to come to an agreement. There was a prospect that when the shooting stopped, it would open the gates for an influx of external resources, which would create new opportunities and launch the country on a new path. And the combination of large-scale external assistance and large needs, economic and human needs, brings to the fore the question whether and how economic policy should be recast in light of the requirements of peace building. In early 1993, a remarkable document had begun circulating in the so-called international community. It was written by Alvaro de Soto, the senior political advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations, who had brokered the Salvadoran Peace Accords, and co-authored by his aide, Graciana del Castillo. And it was called Obstacles to Peace Building. And it was about the difficulties of coordinating economic policy with the implementation of the peace process that had begun with the signing of the peace accords. In that piece, De Soto and Del Castillo deployed a metaphor which haunted me for many years. And it was of El Salvador as a patient lying on an operating table with curtain drawn the length of the patient's body, on either side of which two doctors 
were performing surgery at the same time, neither of them aware of or able to see what the other doctor was doing. On one side, you had the United Nations, which having brokered the peace accords, was now trying to assist in its implementation with a mission in El Salvador for that purpose, with the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, being very much involved. And on the other side, you had the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, pursuing more or less business as usual economic policies, which at that time fell under the general rubrics of structural adjustment and macroeconomic stabilization. De Soto and Del Castillo argued that implementation of the peace accords and economic policy needed to be harmonized, and that without doing so, there was a serious risk that both operations would fail. That is to say that both the peace process would break down and that the economy would not recover. It was in the wake of that that the UNDP asked me to coordinate a study which became known as the Adjustment uh, Towards Peace Project, the aim of which was to think about how economic policy would look in El Salvador without that curtain. If the doctors were collaborating with each other rather than proceeding as if neither of the other existed. And so I put together a team of researchers and we ultimately put together a report which was brought to one of those meetings of the consultative group, the donor group, where the pledges of aid were reviewed and renewed. My reading of the problem that they described was the following, that the conventional macroeconomic policies being pursued by the fund and the bank failed to take into account the special needs of the peace building process and in particular failed to take into account the fiscal requirements of implementing such items in the peace accords as the creation of the National Civilian Police and the land transfer program for ex-combatants. These were both not insubstantial uh, budgetary items. And the government of El Salvador felt fiscally constrained by the need to run a more or less balanced budget, and its commitment to do so was enshrined in the letter of intent it had signed with the International Monetary Fund shortly before. Both the National Civilian Police and the land transfer program were quite underfunded and were running behind schedule, way behind schedule. And De Soto and Del Castillo argued that this tardiness in implementing these critical provisions in the peace accords was endangering the peace process and that the country could soon find itself back in full-scale civil war. As I dug in to the experience in El Salvador, I began to realize that that was not quite the whole story. This was not exactly a case of the government of El Salvador wanting to fund these programs and being prevented from doing so by these big institutions in Washington, D.C., but rather these were programs that the government itself had agreed to fund as part of the peace process, but had agreed to fund reluctantly, very reluctantly. They were not anxious to replace the old paramilitary uh, forces. They were not anxious to distribute land to ex-combatants, particularly from the side of the guerrillas, to reward these people who they saw as the enemy with land. And so they were dragging their feet. And I remember talking to the Central American representative, one of the um, bilateral aid agencies, which was helping to fund the police training academy. And I remember him telling me, you know, whenever the government of El Salvador wants anything for those national civilian police, they come to us. And they say, you know, we need soap. We need uniforms. We need walkie-talkies. We need guns. We need jeeps. We need uniforms. We need all these things for the national civilian police. And if you don't provide them, I'm afraid those police who you want so much just won't be deployed. 
and the government would say, we don't have enough money to fund it ourselves. We have this agreement with the IMF. We can't run a budget deficit beyond a certain amount. Our hands are tied. And what I began to realize was that in a way, the problem was not that the fund and the bank were preventing the government from doing what it wanted to do. They were not using their leverage, their influence to press the government to do things that it had committed to do, but really was reluctant to follow through on. As I dug into this, I began more and more to realize what was missing were any conditions that pertain to implementation of the peace accords that were like, all right, among other things, you have to fulfill your commitments under the peace accords because we understand that failure to do so could trigger a resumption of war and cause our whole economic program to go down in tatters. And the traditional conditions attached to an IMF loan, for example, are to reduce the government budget deficit and so, so on. Sometimes the conditions uh, from the Bretton Woods institutions are to reduce trade barriers, to lower tariffs, etc. And as I moved beyond El Salvador and began to work in other countries, in the Balkans, in Cambodia, in nearby Guatemala, I began to realize that these problems were not unique to El Salvador, but that they were symptoms of a larger problem, the shrug and smug problem, that economists simply were not engaging with the dynamics of war and peace, and that that was something that really needed to change.